This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in everybody to this week's edition of Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me, as always, my cousin Adam, the Jock Strozinski. It's podcasting time, baby. I'm excited. It's week one of the NFL. Tonight, cuz, after everybody gets their stuff done, get home. Prime time. It's the Cowboys and the Bucks. Fantasy football kicks off. Week one with the Detroit Lions is this weekend. We get a chance to talk about Two victories from the teams that we both support in college. Good times aplenty. I am, I, I always look forward to our broadcast and it's a great time today. I'm fully energized, especially after hanging out with you, getting some cocktails, eating the grub. I know that, uh, we've talked about how often you cook and do stuff. I had a great time hanging out with you watching wrestling. Oh my God, man. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good and looking forward to this broadcast. I think people don't really understand how awesome of a guest you really are. This is the only guy I know that shows up with a 20 pack of Coors Light, a fifth of, of whiskey. Uh, he shows up with some white claws for the ladies and also brings a cheesecake. And it's like, all right, let's go. And I was like, no, bro, you didn't have to do anything. Like I had stuff. Like if you wanted some beer, like I had a couple beers. I had enough beers for you to drink. You only drank like two or three. Oh, right, exactly. No, no. So like I had more than enough beers for you. I was like, no, if no. you were gonna get shitty, I didn't have enough. But like if you wanted to have a good time, I had enough. No, here's the thing, which is great. And now you know my secret. I'm always like, oh, what you got? And uh, oh, good, I like this. Oh, you like this? Good. So I get a lay of the land up to what you got so that I know what to bring. Of course, I knew you had enough for me, baby. Uh, no doubt about it, but it's tradition always when you go to a place for the first time, you want to bring and, and let them know, hey, thank you for the invite, welcome, and uh, of course, alcohol, baby. Who doesn't love alcohol? And anytime, anytime you extend, uh, along with your great girlfriend, an opportunity for me to hang out and escape reality for a couple hours, I will pay it back in spades. And, of course, you got to drink a little bit, got to taste Four Roses bourbon for the first time, had a Coors Light with you, shot the breeze. Of course, no doubt about it. And I, I always wanted to let you guys know that I appreciate everything. And, uh, hey, bringing alcohol is fun, man. That way I, I drink your alcohol and replenish it. We can come back again. Dude, you are you are uh, an absolute fantastic guest, and I do want you to know we will be having you back over very soon. Yes. The girlfriend, the girlfriend said so. She was like, they have to come back over. They're fantastic. So uh, she really enjoys your wife, my cousins, and she enjoys you, um, which is weird because sometimes I enjoy you, sometimes I don't enjoy you. But uh, <laughs> I sure as shit enjoyed you on on was that it was Sunday, right? It was you were it, you were an absolute pleasure. You were a treat. So. Thank you yes. for coming over, and thank you for being awesome. And you went above and beyond, and you didn't have to do all that. No, it's all good, baby. It's all good. When we get together, we have a good time, have some cocktails, and, and enjoy some professional wrestling. Man, it was a good time all the way around. The weather, man, I, I, I knew I was a summer guy, but I'm really a fall guy. The humidity is gone. You get a chance to finally hang out. What a, The summer just was so hot. It was crazy. Just to get together on a fall night was absolutely a pleasure to get the bonfire out and uh, see a projector out there on the side of a house dude that was sweet and get to back to, go back to the old stomping ground so it's always in that area always feels good on the east side baby because that's where i grew up so it's always always a good time and you know everybody hear that doc's an east side chevy rider for east sure side, east side till i die baby that's where i grew up that's where i came from and i don't forget it too so that's a it was a good time man all the way around and now we got to break it down because it's week one we're here and now we got a chance to talk about Dan Campbell, the Detroit Lions, Jared Goff. What's going to happen this Sunday? Ford Field, 1 o'clock. It's going to be epic. No matter what happens, I think it's great now that the Detroit Lions are back. I think now to have the fans at Ford Field, I think, is going to be rowdy. It's going to be full of energy and excitement. And I think that the game between the Lions and the 49ers has a chance 
to be closer than expected. But I wanted to ask you because I think everybody is kind of in agreement that you can't expect the Lions to walk away with the victory. You don't expect them to dominate. But it would sure be nice if Dan Campbell, game one, somehow or another, the team rallied and played a nice close-knit game, made some plays late, and maybe took down like a 17-13 victory. I think it would set the tone, and I think it would really, really set the tone for the Dan Campbell era because of the fact that he's done a lot of talking, and we have this young roster. The worst thing I believe could happen is this roster goes out there and gets smoked like 24-10. to 10. I think it'd be disheartening if you lose by more than eight. I mean, the line opened at San Francisco minus seven. It's moved up now to San Francisco seven and a half. I just, I just, I don't see too many pathways for a victory, but man, cause it would sure be great if the Lions somehow or another just shocked everybody and played a great game, like in a flawless game, like just one time, let Dan Campbell show like, whoa. He's not just a talker. He's not just an entertainer. He's not just a social media darling. This is somebody that can actually coach a team and take a young team and outkick their coverage. It would sure be nice, wouldn't it? I think it would help solidify that he's the right pick, at least for the first week. I mean, when you look at their schedule, right, it's 49ers, then you got to go to Green Bay, and then you got to take on the Ravens at home. Oh. I mean, your your first three matchups are, are a bit of a gauntlet for you. So, look, I think for the first week, if you can get a win, it, it puts everybody, I think, at ease. I think it's a really nice, uh, I guess, maybe tip of the cap to Sheila Ford in, in, in the, the, the process that they went through. This is a guy who, like you said, he's a big talker, and it seems as though the team rallies around him, and a lot of times he seems to be in the headlines, and not necessarily for all the right reasons, not wrong reasons, but not necessarily all the right reasons. It's it's because he bites kneecaps and because of some of the things he says and walking around with a with a lion on a on a leash. So it, those aren't necessarily what you want uh, as far as your your head coach getting quoted for uh you much prefer him being quoted for his x's and o's and him being able to scheme out victories so for the first week yes i do agree with you i think it would be great it'd be a nice way to kick off uh the the detroit lions season it'd be nice to kick off dan campbell's first go at being a, a head coach with the detroit lions and it'd be a, a nice way to kick off a new era as so it seems for the detroit lions that being said, I don't know if it's really possible. I don't – like, you think it's going to be a little bit closer than expected, but I'm not 100% sure, man. We I don't think we've seen a whole ton in, in the preseason. And, look, you, you can't really make a ton of grandiose statements based on what you get from the preseason because half the time starters aren't playing, and when they are playing, they're only playing for limited downs anyways – I mean, what Jared Koff played for, what, two series in all of the preseason? So, I, you know, I'm not 100% sure what we're going to actually get. But what I will tell you is the 49ers, if you just kind of line up the roster side by side, 49ers are deeper. 49ers are better. 49ers really seem like they are a team that you're going to have to go and you're going to have to hit 100%. Like, you're going to have to start fast. You're going to have to put points on the board. When you get in the red zone, you can't settle for three. You're going to have to at least take six. So it, it, this is going to be a tough chore for them. And I don't know if this team has the talent. We, we talked about how how sparse the talent was on this and kind of how floored I was with kind of where the floor was on this team. And I don't think in in, in – the, the 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 limited time since the, the the all the cuts have been made, I don't really think they've made themselves that much better of a football team. Now maybe their wide receiver room might be a little bit deeper. I don't necessarily know if it's any better because you don't have a, a, a stud wide receiver in there. But I, I'm not sure what this team can do to take on a team like the 49ers and and get a victory to get Dan Campbell's his what what are we going to call this his 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 inaugural season as the Detroit Lions head coach underway with a uh, with a victory. I'm not sure how they do that. Yeah, see, w well, the game plan and the blueprint sounds easy, 
And it's really kind of simple in that the Lions would have to take possession on offense and run the ball heavily behind that offensive line. I had an opportunity on Wednesday to ask Dan Campbell directly, how excited are you to see the five offensive linemen all together and to see what they're all about? And he said he's super excited, naturally. He said he's going to rely upon them heavily. So what does that mean? That means Jared Goff is going to hand the ball off a shit ton to Swift, Williams, Jefferson, and utilize that the strength of the team. So that means ball control. You're talking about that drive that you got to see the tail end of is what the Lions are hoping for. Ten play drives, six, seven minutes. If you can capitalize with a couple touchdowns with Hawkinson, and then you have the opportunity to kind of game manage a little bit and get out uh, in front. Obviously, if the 49ers get out to a 14, 17, nothing lead, it's done. The Lions don't have a comeback kind of team. They have a team that can kind of plot along, get first downs via the run, and just utilize the strengths that they have. It's going to be boring football, but winning football if you can execute. So if they can make it as boring as possible, hold the time of possession. And I think that in this season, 2021, any game in which they hold a significant time of possession lead and outrush the opponent, I think naturally they're going to win the football game. You, I would, I would not be. That surprised. defense doesn't scare you, though. Like the Lions, yeah, of course it does. Like so, like I mean, that's my thing, right? I'm not sure what we have as far as our cornerbacks. Like I have no idea what Jeff Okuda is going to be. I feel okay with Awarie. I, I feel like he's he's okay. He's, I would say he's more than serviceable. As far as your, you know, you, your safeties go, I'm not 100 percent sure what Tracy Walker is going to be. He's kind of in the camp of Okuda, like. He, he's shown flashes of being a really good safety. And then there are other times where he kind of looks lost. So, uh, look, I, I feel like the, the, the secondary in particular is prone to giving up big plays. So, yeah, you can run the ball and you can possess the ball and you can you can have the ball for 13 minutes out of a 15-minute quarter. But you give the right quarterback those two minutes, he's going to burn you. He's going to hit you deep. And next thing you know, the, the game's tied up. And they only had the ball for, what, two minutes? <laughs> right, right. Debo Samuel, George Kittle, Jimmy Garoppolo can pick apart. And then the, the offensive genius, that is Kyle Shanahan, they can find ways to do some damage. But there's some turnover, obviously, going from Robert Sala, who's moved on. But the new defensive coordinator came out when he – uh, took the job and he said, we want to be an aggressive defense. So they're going to pin their ears back and try to destroy Jared Goff. So that offensive line has to deliver. For me, I think the, 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 I think the key player has to be Goff. I think that if he can control this game, if he can make the third down and six throws to Hawkinson Williams, if he can manage this game, it's cliche, but the quarterback I think has, of the Lions has the most to prove. And I think that there's a strong opportunity that golf is going to need like just a couple throws that he's going to be called upon to make. But I was going to say, I would not be surprised if he throws the ball 20 times or less, but the, the, the key throws late in the game have to be there. He has to execute and he's got to be able to make sure that if he sees something in terms of a deep pass, you got to try, you got to try at least to keep the defense well, honest because you can't play scared. You can't play scared. And like, here's the thing. I, you, you think Jared Goff is, is the key to this game. I'm going to go a little bit of a different direction. I'm going to go Penny Sewell. I think Penny Sewell okay. is the key to this game. And uh, it, it's, it's got a lot a to do with what you said. A because, rookie? well, it has a lot to do with what you said. You have to keep Jared Goff clean. Jared yeah. Goff's a completely different quarterback if you give him time to throw. When he's under pressure, the guy is a human trash can that has been set on fire. So if you, if you can keep him clean and you can keep him out of pressure, and if Penny Sewell can basically do a better job than what we've seen over the course of three preseason games, and he's not an absolute turnstile at right tackle, because I mean, if you were if you were the defensive coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers, would you not overload that right yeah, side? Yeah, I mean of that right side is is obviously the weak point where you have a rookie tackle and then you've got Vitai as your guard, and Vitai, let's be honest, Vitai is not. Not great. So uh, you just overload that right side, and you just bring the house to that right side. You're you're going to get through. So I think if Penny Sewell shows up, plays like we like we think he can play, 
I think it helps Jared Goff, and I think that helps this offense. And like you said, I don't think we need Jared Goff to go out there and necessarily win the game. You need Jared Goff to go out there and not lose the game for you. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that, obviously, you, you brought it up briefly, the secondary is unproven. Mm-hmm. How important of a game is this for Jeff Okuda to not get torched, not give up a 25-yard play or more, not to take a pass interference penalty? Because I just got a feeling like, Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be like, all right, let's see what this kid's got. He's going to test the second-year defensive back. And at the same time, Amani Aruwari Aruwari has the same kind of pressure. This secondary has a lot to prove, just as much as the offense, but shit can get out of hand real quick. And I'm just hoping that whatever's been instilled in this defensive scheme can at least, with a little bit more pressure from the Aquara brothers and the the, the newly designed defensive line – if they can complement the, the secondary, you have a chance maybe to make some plays. But we'll see because it's crazy because cause I could easily see – I could see a lot of things happening. I could see a close win. I could see the 49ers coming in here and kicking the Lions' ass. I could see a heartbreaking loss. I could see the refs screwing the Lions. I could see even the Lions getting out to a 24-10 lead and blowing it late. All kind of scenarios can play itself out because we just don't know yet. Our eyes have not seen what this Lions team looks – like collectively, but I think they're going to surprise some people. I think there's going to be some plays that are made that are going to be eye-opening. I, I, I see it. I can see that Dan Campbell has a vision. I can see this team wants to play well. They're young. What more do they have to lose than go out there and play balls to the wall, play smart football? It's going to be something maybe that you go, wow, it's boring as shit, but this is something that could win. Running the ball, trying to get DeAndre Swift going, but you know the worst case scenario, and it just keeps coming in my mind. I hate to be this way, but I can see Swift having like 80 yards in the first half and then hurting his groin the first <laughs> period of the second half. You know, I can just see. All I mean, that. can't you? It, it it would make sense, yeah, because right. that's what his track record's been. So yeah, it makes total so, sense. So I can see all that, but I just find it fascinating that with the Lions, you could just really see everything that could happen. So I'm excited to see it. I really, really am. What do you think is the best case scenario for the Lions, at least through the first half of the season or for the year? I think best case scenario for the Detroit Lions is they end up early in the season. They they get a couple wins that we didn't expect. So you get a win against the 49ers. Uh, you go on the road. You, you eke out a win against Green Bay in Green Bay. And I think that kind of helps set your season and get it going. I think long term, Jared Goff stays healthy. I think you get a lot more development out of a guy uh, like DeAndre Swift. Uh, you see Jeff Okuda take that next step forward, and we actually get to see what everybody was talking about when he was when he was drafted third overall. Uh, he takes that progression and really helps set that defense up. The uh, the Okwara brothers, uh, they look like they are legit pass rushing threats and are able to put pressure on quarterbacks. I, I think big picture, I think the one thing that would bode really, really well for this team going forward, best case scenario, you are solidified in your belief that Dan Campbell is the right head coach for this team. And the way that's done, it's not necessarily going to be done in wins and losses. It will be done by his coaching acumen in the game, uh, being able to you know utilize timeouts correctly. Uh, being able to throw flags correctly to challenge plays, uh, getting guys in the right position, or being able to diagnose and, and read what is going on on the field and then addressing and then making those second-half adjustments and coming out and taking advantage of what you've seen. So if Dan Campbell's able to do all of that, I think that bodes really well for the team. That's the best-case scenario. You You then compound that with, what you got going on in the front office and some of the guys that were picked up, uh, whether it be through free agency, whether it be through the draft, whether it be guys who are waiver wire pickups, those guys come out and they kind of flash a little bit. And it lets you know that what you've got as a brain trust for the Detroit Lions is actually going to work. Because I, I look, when Bob Quinn came in, you were kind of uneasy because you knew he didn't want Jim Caldwell. You knew who he wanted. And then it was just kind of like a ticking time bomb. Jim Caldwell goes out there, wins nine games, goes nine and seven, and this team's like a game out of the playoffs. And they're like, oh, we got to let you go because you didn't do enough. And he goes out, brings in his butt boy, and it, it almost felt like from day one it just wasn't going to work. So 
I don't have that feeling with Dan Campbell, and I don't have that feeling with Brad Holmes. I don't feel like it's go- not going to work. So if you can you can add some confidence to that by by doing those things that I mentioned, I think that helps the entire organization. I think it makes the fan base feel much much better about everything. You know, absolutely. But time's ticking right away because of the fact that. For Brad Holmes, he made some selections that people are going to question. He's made some moves already, and right away, his first draft selection, you know, he was banging the table. He was super excited, and he selected Panay Sewell, and he has to deliver. And he just can't make the ultimate mistake because what you don't want to have happen is Justin Fields be the guy right away that everybody talks about throughout the course of his tenure because you you had the chance to take a quarterback, and Justin Fields, sooner rather than later, is going to hit the field. And... As you, as we look, as everybody's, as everybody's kind of watched college football, the quarterbacks are okay, but I don't see a Patrick Mahomes in the 2022 draft. I don't see a guy that would absolutely be the guy that I'm clamoring for. I mean, Corral was pretty sweet from Ole Miss, but he's got some baggage that people are concerned about. But at this I'm point, I'm telling you, week, what is it, week four? Week four. What you're going to get oh, is you're going to get oh, Justin Fields and Brashad Perriman. Touchdown. Oh, oh, yeah. And uh, the next touchdown is Justin Fields to Jesse James, tight end, in tight the end zone, <laughs> burning Derek Barnes. <laughs> you know, it's it just – let's just not have that happen. Let's turn around the narrative of the Lions being the worst team in the National Football League. I, I hope not, but we'll see what happens. I, I do think we're going to see progression week to week. I think there's going to be games where Dan Campbell really outshines the competition. There's going to be some games where the Lions look like, whoa, like an expansion team. So I can't wait to see it. It's going to be week one. Stay tuned to Detroit Sports Podcast. Stay tuned to SIO Alliance. We break it all down. We're there. We're inside Allen Park. We've infiltrated the facility. We're there. We're talking to the guys, asking questions every single day trying to elicit reactions, and point blank, we're going to ask the questions that we feel. You know, I asked Brad Holmes directly. I said, how do you fairly evaluate Jared Goff when the wide receivers are like this? They're not the strength of the team. I didn't say they were weak. I said they were not the strength of the team, which, of course, he took the PC approach. But then, which was funny, later on in his presser, he was asked, what's the strength of the team? He didn't say wide receiver. So I asked the question in the best way possible. And he just, like I said, he's a fan of Jared Goff, and I give him credit for supporting his decision. But we shall see, because Jared Goff, I think, represents kind of what the Lions can be, but also at the same time, he could flame out real quick. Like, I could see him becoming the the guy that everybody kind of points the finger at and says, oh, my God, you're such a downgrade from Stafford, and they could turn on him real quick. So I Wouldn't just he hope... Be, could he be the worst-case scenario? Like, oh, my he, God, he just yes. basically... Either A, one gets hurt because we both talked about how, how there's no depth in that QB room. So either A, he gets hurt, or B, he is his worst self. He oh is God. the worst Jared Goff that okay. you could ever okay. get. You know what? You said worst case scenario for the season. Here's worst case scenario. Drive number one, first play is a two-yard handoff. Second play is a rollout. He drops the football. Just drops it because of his hands and, and things like that. He just turns the football over a uh, multitude of times because – he is prone to turn the ball over. He is uh, at times prone to play bad, but he just needs to kind of look like the guy. He can't look like a first-year Detroit Lions quarterback. He has to look like he knows what he's doing. He's picked up some things like he can take take advantage of his veteran savvy. We don't want to see this guy looking like, oh, my God, I'm lost. I'm not confident. I'm somebody that is getting taken advantage of by Nick Bosa and the entire San Francisco 49ers defense. I hope that Goff at least – plays a modicum of quarterback something to the point where we can say okay there's something to build on but yeah i could see it going bad right away and 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 the crowd in detroit there's no honeymoon period for jared goff no there there isn't none they'll boo quickly it's going to be a rowdy house but this Lions fan base is not going to be one that's going to be like oh jared you drop the football or or you throw wobblers or you throw interceptions they're not going to have that in any way shape or form he knows potentially what could happen, so that's why I think it's going to be ultra conservative. That's why they can't get behind. I kind of want to see it. I mean, if I wasn't a this. fan too, I want to see it too. Though, if the Lions do get behind, how does Jared Goff respond? Can Dan Campbell say, "Well, screw the running game plan. Let's just start zinging it and see what happens"? Yeah, 
I, I mean, I, I think you bring up you you bring up a a really interesting point when you say that there's zero honeymoon period for Jared. No, Park. no. How no, would no, you no. like to be the guy who has <laughs> to go in? And basically take over for the yeah. best Detroit Lions quarterback that right. multiple generations have ever seen. Like Jared Goff is, or, or Matt, Matthew Stafford was like the best quarterback <laughs> in a Detroit Lions uniform that my dad, I think, might have seen. And like, look, we had Eric Kramer. You and I both had Eric Kramer growing up, and I loved Eric Kramer. But Eric Kramer was only here for a little bit of time. And Eric Kramer didn't really help win you a whole lot. Matthew Stafford, if you were to line them up, Matthew Stafford's obviously a better quarterback than Eric Kramer. So Matthew Stafford, best quarterback in Lions history, we'll say. I mean, you want to go? Top three, at least minimum. Top three. Okay, there you go. So top three. So obviously generational franchise talent. You now have to basically walk in this man's footsteps and, and try to do what he does, and you don't have any of the same talents that he does like you don't have the arm strength he does you don't have the ability to fit a ball inside of a small window like he does i don't think jared goff has the ability to pull rabbits out of his hat like matt stafford was able to do all that being said maybe maybe in this underdog role maybe he succeeds maybe maybe he makes us forget matt stafford i don't think it's possible but maybe he does like look me and you not really huge fans of matt stafford right we're kind of indifferent on him he had good games. He had a lot of bad games, and there are a lot of things that he did that cost this team some football games, but he also won this team some football games. Uh, so it's kind of a mixed bag with Matt Stafford. Jared Goff, I don't know. Bro, I don't know what you're going to get from him. You don't know. <laughs> like, don't I, know. Really, I really don't. It's going to be weird because he's, he's, like he's like a two-faced quarterback, man. There is, there is the Jared Goff that you had most of last season, and then there's Jared Goff who – Help get a a, a a a a Rams team to to the playoffs and got them to the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's gonna be wild. All right, it's that time, prediction time, baby. What do you see happening? Lay it on me. Uh, I know people are gonna read your prediction more more thoroughly this Sunday morning. What's gonna happen this week with the Detroit Lions? This week with the Detroit Lions, Lions start off fast. I think they get some points on their first drive. Uh, probably end up having to settle for a field goal. So we'll try out that new field goal kicker we got. And I think very quickly the 49ers respond. Uh, it's a little bit of a slugfest. I think the Lions end up trading touchdowns for field goals. And in the end, they end up losing to the 49ers. I'm going to say 32 to 17. 30 17 or 32 17? 32 17. 32 17. Ah, I think the defense. I think the Lions are going to make this a really sloppy game. I don't see it being that high scoring. I think it's going to be a 23-17 loss. Lions cover, but they'll be in it, mix and match, but uh, 49ers just have too much late, uh, potentially getting out to maybe early 23-14 lead and just holding on. So uh, it's going to be good, competitive football, but a loss. Maybe even a a closer loss than that. But, yeah, I, I, I can't predict a victory week one. Just yet. So we'll see how the Lions shake out. Sunday, 1 p.m. Message all the way through the game. We'll be there at Detroit Podcast and let us know what you think. Good, bad, and different. Highlight, low light. Anything that you see that you want to talk about the Detroit Lions, we'll be tweeting and we'll be inside Ford Field covering the game. Now, real quickly, cuz, before we get out of here, at least we can enjoy week one of college football because both Michigan and Michigan State had the opportunity to play well and win their season opener. But, man, because I was a little disappointed in myself in that I couldn't hang last Friday night. I was grinding. It was the end of a long week. I was sure as hell excited I got to see the uh, Kenneth Walker touchdown. I was thrilled with that. I got the opportunity to see that. So that was awesome. I was flipping around, and unfortunately, the game that was on ESPN took precedence. So I was flipping around, and all of a sudden, I see this Michigan State transfer just running up and down the sideline. I'm like, holy shit. And I was like, God, what's wrong? And I'm like, oh, my God, did, did, the Spartans that didn't have a, a running back score a touchdown all of last year. This is great. 75-yard touchdown by a Wake Forest transfer because the game dragged on by, like, 1030. I nodded off, woke up. 11.15, 11.30, fell asleep again, 12.15, the game was still on. 
I was like, what the hell is going on with this three and a half, three hour and 45 minute game? I couldn't hang. I could not stay up for it top to bottom, but it was a nice destructive victory for the Spartans. How often do you get a chance to see the Spartans take on a bad football team on the road and then dominate them the way in which you want to with a running back? It was great. It was great to see the quarterback, the quarterback play. Unfortunately, we got a little bit of concern on the defense. I'm not sure there's going to be enough of a pass rush going on to, to compete against the big dogs, but hell, I'm going to take it. Week one was enjoyable as fuck, and I was Bro. very, very, very happy to get the W. But, dude, I couldn't hang. we got to find a way to cut these games down, bro. Dude. you you got to have th- these games capped at three hours. Max, <laughs> so, Max. So here's the thing. I was, you know, I undertook a, a monstrous uh, renovation project this past weekend. I was running around. I was swapping trucks. I had to go get my dad's truck. Uh, I had to go pick up a door, pick up multiple other items. I was running around unloading everything, getting things situated, uh, doing some quick demo work. So when I woke up on Saturday after we recorded our, our wrestling podcast, we'd be able to just go right into, right into construction work. When I tell you that you were blowing my phone up and I was like, what's going on? And you're like, Kenneth Walker just like basically blew through everybody and, and scored a touchdown. This dude's fast. And I was like, all right, cool. That was like at eight. When I got done doing stuff and I finally got into bed, mind you, I had to watch three hours of wrestling in the middle of all this. I watched three hours of wrestling, got done unloading everything. I crawled into bed. It was like 12, maybe 12, 15. I was stunned this game was still going on. <laughs> yes. I caught, I caught the end of the fourth, and I was like, what the hell? Like, how can I, how can I basically do like a whole day's worth of work and still be able to catch the end of this game? It was amazing. It, was, it blew my mind. Yeah, Absolutely it was stunning. It was great to see. Finally, now we got a cupcake uh, Saturday, Youngstown State. And how, wait, hold a- on. How do you feel? How do you feel about what you've seen in the first game? So this was a team that essentially had quadriplegics for running backs last year. Yes. You now have a stud running back. You got a quarterback who looks like I don't think he's going to light the world on fire, but I think he's he's a very adept game manager. I think he's going to help control. A lot of the yeah. plays, he's going to make some big plays here and there, but I'm not looking at him setting the world on fire. This reminds me of that old school Michigan State football team, the one that D'Antonio helped get uh, into the college football playoff. It's going to be a run heavy attack. You're going to have a quarterback who's going to take some chances, yeah. and you're going to lean on your defense. Yeah, Peyton Thorne looks like the guy. Good choice, solid arm, and you just got to worry about the defense because I'm not sure they're going to bring enough pressure or they got enough to handle business, but you've seen some swagger with Mel Tucker and you start to see the imprint of a football team that can compete old school. It looked like the Michigan state football brand rough in the trenches, Mm -hmm. handle your business, pound the rock and take advantage of an opportunity. And it's an opportunity that we got a chance to see maybe a little bit of a sec football, a speedy running back that could elude tacklers. That was awesome to see, and it's just nice to see that a team that you're better than, clearly, you dominate, and so that made it better all the way around. So I was very, very happy, very, very impressed. Yeah, I thought it was a, I thought it was a big win. Usually, Northwestern's a pretty tough team, especially going on the road and playing at Northwestern, and it looked like Michigan State fans showed up for this game. I, look, I was impressed all the way around. I think Michigan State, uh, we talked about this last week, I think, Future is extremely bright for Michigan State. I think Mel Tucker is doing a fantastic job over there. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. So, what was your takeaway? Your big takeaway from what you saw in the Michigan victory uh, at home at the Big House? It looks like you maybe have figured out and kind of hit on your quarterback. And again, I think it's similar to what you got going on in Michigan State. He's—I don't think he's going to be a guy who's going to light the world on fire, but I think he's a guy who can help win you some games. I think he's a guy who's going to for the most part, manage the game and, and not really cost you. I, I think that this this passing attack looks pretty nice. Uh, I'm not willing to buy in yet. Like, I'm still kind of on the fence. And this is just kind of where I'm at okay. as, a, uh, as a Michigan fan. Um, I want Harbaugh gone, and I'm kind of over it. So I'm in this weird quandary where it's like I want my team to do well, but I also want them to do bad because anything to get Harbaugh out helps. Sure. So I'm in this weird spot, you know. 
now J.J. McCarthy had a highlight throw, and here's the thing, which was fascinating, because we've all been used to Dan Orlovsky, you know, sucking at the teeth of the Detroit Lions and Matthew Stafford. We weren't used to him doing that for J.J. McCarthy. He was out there like, oh, my God, look at that arm. Oh, my God, that looks like Mahomes. Oh, my God, the athleticism. He damn near incited a riot with his commentary, which I, of course, took advantage of and said, oh, yeah, okay. I think you do have a controversy because of the fact that J.J. McCarthy, not yet, not yet worthy of starter status, but he looks like he's got more high-end talent. Cade McNamara does not obviously have the same arm as J.J. McCarthy. And McCarthy, if he has athleticism with that game and has the ability to throw the ball that deep and can make plays, I think you're going to start to hear more rumblings for J.J. as the season progresses, which I think is going to be a storyline to pay attention to. The controversy hasn't started just yet, but Dan Orlovsky was definitely loving himself some J.J. McCarthy after that touchdown. It was a highlight touchdown. It was great, and it was good at least Michigan had a chance to put in some reserves because you were whooping that ass so good. So it was good to see Michigan and Michigan State win, but are you okay with Kate McNamara? Seems the more safe play, but... McCarthy looks like the stud quarterback at the program. So to me, it, it kind of feels like McCarthy is the guy who has the sizzle, right? Yeah, he's sizzle, the, baby. He, he's got the pop. And I think what you'll end up getting, I think McNamara is is the safe play. Um, I think what usually happens, though, is quarterbacks don't usually make it all the way through the season. At least Michigan quarterbacks don't. Right. I think at some point you'll get to see McCarthy. Um, it'll be interesting, I think, going into next year, because I think McNamara will be back next year. Uh, who kind of takes that job? Does McCarthy take that job away from McNamara? That'll be interesting. Next year will be interesting. Right and now, th- it's it's McNamara's job. Yeah, and I think you and I both will safely predict victories over Washington at home for Michigan and an easy victory for the, the Spartans over Youngstown State in mm-hmm. their home opener. All right, make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Make sure... Anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast, you type in Detroit Sports Podcast, and you can find the Detroit Sports Podcast Network and all the daily content that you love, covering Michigan Athletics, Michigan State, the Detroit Lions, all the pro teams here in town. We greatly appreciate your time. Podcasting time is always a great opportunity to bullshit and talk sports, and you guys have let us do that now for the last seven years, spanning well over 400 episodes, 2,000 on the network, and we're grateful for each and every day that we have a chance to broadcast on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network.